uh, thank you. Please uh, let me know if you can uh, see my slide. Uh, not yet. You can share the slides now. Um, can you see? Yes, you just need to launch the presentation mode, please. Thank you. Um, Perfect. This does is it change? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. Does it change? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much. So thank you for inviting me uh, in today's uh, talk, which is about fighting pneumonia and agenda for action. And I'll try to talk about the critical role of pulse oximetry in reducing childhood pneumonia deaths. Just give me a second. So before I... Um, get into the details of, of, of today's presentation, let's try to talk about childhood pneumonia deaths as a whole. And one of the ways of looking at it is by counting numbers and, 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 and trying to count numbers with time. I will start this presentation and I'm expected to finish this presentation in 10 minutes. In that 10 minutes, the world will gonna see 2,600 new ca cases of childhood pneumonia. That's a big number. And in that 10 minute, 17 of them, 17 those, of those children will gonna die. And that is unacceptable. And what is more unacceptable is that out of those 17 children who are gonna die due to pneumonia, almost all of them will gonna die in Southeast Asia and Africa, almost all of them. And most probably that is the reason why we don't talk about pneumonia the way we should. It is the number one killer among children. It is the number one infectious reasons for which children are dying. And that is why it is the forgotten killer. So let's not forget them. Let's talk about them. Let's understand their problem. Let's do something about them. Let's save them. In order to save them, we know this is the cause, but what are the reasons? Are there some common threats? One of the threats is hypoxemia, meaning low oxygen saturation in blood. And regarding hypoxemia, these are the two questions. Is it common among childhood pneumonia and does hypoxemia kill? So we conducted a systematic review to identify, is it common among children with pneumonia, hypoxemia? And we found that among the severe pneumonia cases, almost 41% of them had hypoxemia. And among the non-severe pneumonia cases, almost 8% of them had hypoxemia. Again, for me, it's easier to see things in number rather than in percentage and rates. So we tried to convert them into numbers. And this is our estimate that millions of children around the world are being admitted in the hospitals every year who needs oxygen and who are suffering from hypoxemia. So that means that hypoxemic pneumonia, these children are coming to our hospitals in millions and we have to be ready to treat them, to manage them and give them what they need, oxygen. So the next question was that, do they kill? And this is a study that we didn't conduct, but somebody did. And it was a meta-analysis trying to look at what is the additional risk of hypoxemia if a child is suffering from pneumonia and an hypoxemia. And the pulled estimate is that it actually adds five times more risks of deaths. That's a big number, five times the risk. So we conducted this study in our hospital at ICTDRB hospital where we treat children with pneumonia. And for us, hypoxemia as a death predictor was 10 times and hypoxemia as a management failure where the proxy is referral was all around six times. These are big numbers, 10 times and six times when we were trying to treat and God wonders what happened in facilities where, we, where they don't have trained manpower and where they don't have the access to the resources to manage these babies and these children. So therefore, the answer is yes, hypoxemia is common among childhood pneumonia. And yes, hypoxemia kills. The next question is that what can we do? Actually, we know what to do. We have talked about the, the pledge the Ending Preventable Child Deaths from Pneumonia and Diarrhea Pledge. We have the Prevent, Protect and Treat framework. And in that particular framework, the corner box was oxygen therapy. And in that oxygen therapy, we talked about we have to identify children who are suffering from hypoxemia and we need to monitor them. We need to treat them. We need to give them oxygen and to do so, 
one of the really, really important tools that we have is pulse oximetry. And acknowledging this, WHO, in their guideline, the Integrated Management of Childhood Illness Guideline, which is used in most of the low and middle income countries for outpatient management of pneumonia, has recommended this, that if you have pulse oximetry available, assess the oxygen saturation. And if you find it's less than 90, refer them, treat them. So that means that we have a recommendation of using pulse oximetry. But the question is that, is this recommendation really feasible for countries like Bangladesh, where we are always suffering from lack of resources? And this lack of resources are of many kinds, human, logistics, financing, and more importantly, political commitment. So let's talk about feasibility. We tried to conduct an implementation research in one of the districts in Bangladesh. And we tried to look at different implementation research variables recommended by WHO, this framework. We did not look at coverage and implementation costs, rather focus on adoption, appropriateness, feasibility, fidelity, acceptability, and sustainability. And this is the answer to that question. I know this is a big, long, busy slide. So let's try to walk you through the questions. The first question was, was about if we give pulse oximetry to first level facilities, do the routine healthcare providers, do the healthcare providers who are employed by the system use them? The answer is yes, at least they use them. The next question was about feasibility. Are they doing it correctly? So that means that do they get successful in their attempts? Almost 90% of the cases, they are successful in their attempts. And they're successful in their attempts in almost 85% of the cases in their first attempt, in first time trying. And they are successful with their attempts within the golden one minutes per pneumonia assessment is 70% of the times. So I think it's reasonably feasible. Regarding the fidelity, where they're following the procedures, where they're following the standard operating procedures and the steps, again, it was more than 90%. Then we also looked at acceptability. What are the healthcare workers feeling that this pulse oximetry use was useful? Was it important? And we also asked the caregivers of the children that do you think that this is useful? And if you visit the facility next time, you're going to allow your child to be assessed with the pulse oximetry. And for all of these cases, the result was more than 90%. And another question was about sustainability. These assessments six months apart in those facilities. And the result was 90% of the times these impressive results were sustained. And I know that I have, make, I have skipped one, the appropriateness part of that. This is a part where we are trying to look at the challenges faced by the healthcare workers regarding using pulse oximetry. So drive into the detail. We had a qualitative research done to identify what are the reported challenges by the healthcare workers while they're using pulse oximetry. We found that there are device-related challenges, patient-related challenges, environment-related challenges, and finally, user-related challenges. So we have tried to summarize these challenges in these categories. And after that, so summarize the challenge statements in these phrases. And we got the focus group discussion with the healthcare workers so that our analysis was validated and vouched by them that yes, these are the challenge statements that they were facing. And then we conducted a survey, a quantitative survey, where one means that, oh, that's not a big challenge for me, and five means that was a really big challenge for me. And with the focus group discussions, we also set an a priori challenge cutoff, that if any mean comes with its standard deviation above four and more, that means that that's a real challenge. But if it is less than four, then it's actually not a real challenge. And this was the result. You can see none of the cutoffs, none of the challenges are all in the red dots with their confidence interval. And we showed that to the healthcare workers and they believe that maybe they think that's a challenge, but when it really comes down to comparative estimate, it's actually not that challenging, but there are some issues and these are navigational and these are operational issues that are overcomable. So the answer to that question was that it seems like introducing pulse oximetry in a resource poor setting is feasible. But the question is that, is it effective? The two implementation research variables that we could not address in our study. But that's the beauty of research, that's the beauty of science, that's the beauty of collaboration that somebody else did. In Ethiopia, they did a randomized control trial where they looked at the 
effect and the impact of introducing pulse oximetry in first level facilities. And they found that introduction of the pulse oximetry actually increases the probability of severe pneumonia classification and identification. Almost 10 percent point increase. That's a big increase. And that's why life and death will going to happen. That's what will going to help us in achieving our SDGs. And at what cost? They have identified that an average cost of $25, that's what we're going to take for an additional severe pneumonia diagnosis in the intervention compared to the $17.98 in the comparison estimate. I don't think for diagnosing one severe additional pneumonia case, the cost difference is that much in a resource poor settings. So the effectiveness question was answered and the impact question was answered. But these were for primary data. These were from one country. So we looked at this paper, which actually did a model estimate and suggested that introducing pulse oximetry in 15 high burden pneumonia countries can actually avert 150,000 deaths. That's a huge number. Remember, LEED started with 700 to 800,000 total deaths. This can take care of 150,000. And this will be a cost effective intervention. So that means that introducing pulse oximetry is recommended. It seems to be effective and cost effective. And there is clear indication that it can have a very, very big impact. But as I was going through that, I was also remembering the things that Eric said, that we know a lot, but we also know that we don't know a lot of the part about introducing pulse oximetry. But we also don't know the unknown, unknown fact of that. But having said that, I think I want to boldly pledge that I think we know enough to push for the agenda that in all the resource poor settings, in the outpatient, in the emergencies, and in the inpatient, at least a simple device of pulse oximetry should be introduced. And after that, there should be monitoring, capacity development, and continuous push so that at least no child with hypoxemia dies without oxygen. And that's where this picture comes into question. As researchers, as activists, as, as, as people who are trying to be the voice of those children who are dying due to pneumonia without necessary oxygen, we are these front tugboats. We have to somehow find enough strength so that the health systems, the big boat starts moving. And when it really moves, only then we will be able to deliver the bigger goods. Thank you very much. This is Ahmed Esanur Rahman from ICTDRB.